Pode ir. Oi. Pode testar aí para mim, por favor.
Quando a gente de casa, meu nome é Adriana Santos. So my name is Adriana Santos, and I have the honor and the pleasure of being the manager of education here at Sesc Rio de Janeiro. Now, before calling Marcelo on stage, I would like to thank the team here at this at the headquarters, my team. Uh, and we're a team and we all work together and this whole team worked really hard to get to uh, this point in time and for this to happen there's there are a lot of there's a lot of dialogue a lot of conversations and people in my team work the whole month preparing for this event so i would like you to help me give to give them a round of applause And I would also like to thank the teams from the different units because it's the units that allow our work to, with education to move forward. So I'm happy that we'll be able to provide childhood education and work with digital inclusion and we will also work with the elderly. We are present in schools, we're present in vocational schools and intercultural schools. We have lots of different activities. We have an initiative called Science Everywhere. So basically, the people who develop all of this and the people who are in touch with the public are exactly these teams that I just mentioned, and they're representing education very well. I would also like to thank the presence of the different schools and the federal uh, Fluminense University, and I would also like to thank the speakers for being here today. This morning, we changed the schedule a little bit in order to be able to include everyone. So now we're restarting with our activities. So now I should leave the stage so that you may be able to watch a video. Gabriel Chalita. Carlos Álvares, Marcelo Zig, José Sena, Raquel Souza, Ana Paula Simonazzi, Antônio Firmino, Cosme Philipsen, Karina Alves, Adriano Rocha, Anne Ocoró, Márcia Souza, Alian Wamiri, Analu Pimenta, Alicia Fernanda Sagues, Gabriela Badillo, Obirino Dara, Emílio Figueira, David Rodrigues, Josiel Conrad, Thaís Borges, Conceição Evaristo, Bárbara Carini, Isaca Manassara, Bernardo de la Vega, Jaqueline Gomes, Glenda Cristina, Erika Coachman, Fourth Con World Conference on Education by Sesc Rio. Good afternoon. I was speaking outside the microphone so that you could locate me. Now I'm going to describe myself. I'm Priscila. 
I have mixed color skin, I have brown eyes and brown hair, I'm using a pink pants and a white shirt, I'm using glasses, I'm a teacher, and here at the headquarters I'm an education analyst. And I wrote my script here. So it's great to be here at this conference that was worked on very hard by everyone in the team. And so it's an honor to be here. Adriano and I, and Adriano being the analyst responsible for the awareness campaign, uh, we've talked a lot about, about intersectionality and the social markers for exclusion. It's necessary for us to fight for inclusion. But we, sh we should also fight for anti-ableism and we should also fight for anti-racism. Inclusion is not a favor, it's an obligation. An, ob an obligation that, uh, for everyone. And to talk about these biases, I would like to call on stage Marcelo Zigi. He's a philosopher, speaker, an activist, and he's our master of ceremonies. Hello. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Okay, I'm going to describe myself. I'm a black person with dark skin and I have dreads. I use round glasses. I have a white beard. I don't have a mustache. I'm using a black shirt and a pearl necklace and a white skirt with the image of a black woman. I'm using black sneakers. I'm sitting on my wheelchair because I'm a person with a disability. It's a pleasure and an honor to be here. Before beginning this conference or my talk, I would like to thank you for inviting me to be here representing people with this invitation with the Seski ends up including a group of people here on stage that is a group of black people people with disabilities and like I said and black people with disabilities so I'm 49 years old and when uh, I became disabled at 21 years of age, when I jumped off a bridge into the shallow waters of a river and I ended up severing my spinal cord. So the spinal cord is like the charging cable of a cell phone. So it's something that is responsible for sending messages within the body and for creating connections between the brain and the rest of the body in relation to to the senses and movement. So because I severed my spinal cord, I ended up not being able to feel or move um, and I needed to use a wheelchair in order to move. I got into college, I got a degree in philosophy. I create a project called Mergulho uh, Cidadão in order to help people to avoid the kinds of accidents that I uh, suffered. And we don't really need financial resources. Actually, uh, you know, uh, we work trying to avoid the kind of accidents uh, that, that, that I ended up suffering uh, by informing people because anybody can jump off you know, vessels or, or hills into the, bee, uh, to, to, into the water. And sometimes we're not aware of the kinds of risks uh, of these kinds of activities. Uh, our slogan is, it's worse to be a victim of lack of education than, uh, than a victim of, uh, of an accident. So we try to prevent accidents. We try, and we try to do this because these accidents can lead to death. So I, I got into public service. In my, fir in my first position, I worked in a census of the National St Statistics Office. And in another position, I worked at a state company related to sanitation. I also helped 
with uh, the, the, uh, the creation of a committee related to equality. And today, I'm a spokesperson and a diversity consultant at a company called Inclua, which is responsible for recruiting and selecting people with disabilities for the workplace. So I help companies to, I, I help raise awareness within companies in relation to the hiring of professionals with disabilities. I'm also the founder of Quilombo PCD, which is a collective of black people with disabilities. These, uh, and I, I also have two schools, um, I actually I have a, a, a child, a son, uh, with whom I fought against prejudice. So people would always ask me whether this person was my son and whether I would be able to uh, educate my son. And I also have my grandson uh, that has never really asked me why I can't move and why I use a wheelchair to move around. My grandson actually asks me about my wheelchair to understand whether it's charged up so that we can race, me in my wheelchair and him in, on his bike. So, please feel free to participate in this conversation. And I wanted to start with this introduction so that we can start by facing this idea of incapacity that ends up imprisoning people with disabilities in our society. And here we're talking about ableism. Ableism is any kind of prejudice or exclusion of these people from society. Ableism is based on the medical idea of disability, which is that idea that identifies a disability based on the person's body. And this disability is considered a disease that must be cured or a defect that must be corrected or as something that causes problems for social inclusion. But if ableism were correct, then I wouldn't be able to mention any, any of the activities that I described to you because all of these activities are activities that I've already uh, been a part of as a person using a wheelchair. And my wheelchair has been my ally to live through these experiences. Now, when I told you to feel free to participate in this conversation, I was being honest. I, you know, I, uh, for us to have a better understanding of ableism, I would like to ask you a question. I want to have an activity here with all of you. And please feel free to answer this question. So now that I've already introduced myself and now that we have some kind of relationship going, and now that you know that I'm a person with a disability, I would like to know which of you here would invite me to have coffee in your house. I want you to reflect on that idea that I'm going to be in your homes with a wheelchair. So would anybody invite me? Wow, we've got a lot of raised hands. And look, I love coffee, and I can even take couscous to your house. Okay, so now let me ask you a second question. And I'm going to ask a few questions, okay? Do you want to use the microphone? Would anybody like to answer my questions uh, using the microphone? Justo, justíssimo. So, I'm already inviting you to come to my house to have some coffee, and you'll be able to go in, you'll be able to have coffee. If you want to go to the restroom, you'll be able to do that. So, please feel welcome at my house. Okay, great. So, that means that you're, uh, does that mean that you actually know somebody who uses a wheelchair? Yes and no. Okay, so in your restroom, do you have the support bars? No, I don't. 
Você tá vendo meu tamanho, né? But oh. you see how big I am, right? Você acha que a gente vai conseguir Do you think isso? we'll be able to figure things out? I don't know, you're going to have to go there. Well, I'm scared of of going to your house to drink some coffee. And then ah, I'm afraid that at the end of the day, you're, we're going to have two people leaving your house. Because, you know, I'm, uh, I'm over uh, 1.9 meters tall. Well, I guess you're going to have to go to my house so that we can find out what's going to happen. Okay, well, thank you for the invitation. So, based on what she said, I would now like to ask you a second question. If during our meeting, if I need to use the restroom, is that okay? Are we still going to be having coffee? Okay, so I can see that we still got some raised hands. Okay, so would you like to answer the question? Hello, good afternoon. I'm called Liani. I'm a teacher. And uh, just responding to what you said, the flat where I live was um, belonged to elderly people, so its structure is um, very comfortable for any person to use. There are side um, bars for people to use. All the doors are very wide and the whole structure is of the building is adapted even though it's an old building it was adapted because there are a lot of people who think about these people and everybody mobilized to make the uh, building ac accessible i prefer the other word you use which was comfortable and not accessible that's what we're talking about. <laughs> I think you're right. I think it's important to leave people comfortable so that they can be independent uh, without anybody having to be there to give them support. And they, it's got support, has it, in the bathroom? Yes, it has, even in the shower cubicle. And as I say, the uh, doors are all very wide. <laughs> Okay, so what day are we going to have coffee? <laughs> Whenever you want, I'm available. Somebody else would like to maybe respond? Good. Hello, good afternoon, Marcelo. My name is Leila. Oh, let's talk to this lady here first, and then we'll talk to you, Marcela. I'm Maria Lucia. I'm a journalist. I'm a volunteer as well in the in a museum on the island of Paquetá, which is where I live. And the whole museum there is um, accessible. It was built by somebody who was very important for the liberation of black people in Brazil. It's completely adapted. So if you'd like to come and visit the museum, you're invited um, to take, have a coffee with me in the museum. Not at my home. It's an old building. It's completely opposite to the museum. But you're more than invited because um, the museum is also uh, very focused on education. I'm very happy that it's comfortable for all the people, but I also want to know your home. <laughs> I'm joking, that's fine. There's somebody else. So I'm Leila, I am a teacher, and my mum uses a wheelchair, and my father has Parkinson's, uh, so he has limited mobility, so my home had to be adapted. It's an accessible bathroom, it's got a higher um, toilet seat, uh, we've got, um, they're all wider than a meter wide, the doors, so you can move around safely, and I really like coffee too. It has to be very strong though. Uh, okay, that's fine, but I need to be careful because I've got two invitations now so that we don't have a conflict in our diaries. <laughs> Thank you. 
It's incredible, isn't it, how such a simple question can provoke us and make us think and maybe review um, the spaces where we live to make them more welcoming, more comfortable, um, using a different perspective to understand that our you know, homes aren't comfortable for everybody. Those of you who can't invite me or who would like to invite me but can't really welcome me in the way they could, we will this shows you explicitly that you cannot um, have friendships with people from your university, some from a party or from work or a, a relative um, if they use a wheelchair unless you're going to talk to them on the on a mobile phone. But we're talking about something that's much more critical than this. Imagine if you've got limited mobility temporarily where you have to use a wheelchair even just for a short period of time. How are you going to deal with that situation? Are you going to help ask somebody who's a close friend to become a uh, hostage because of you not being able to use your house while you're recuperating? Will you move to somebody else's house where you're going to have um, a better standard of living during this process? But some, it's even more serious than this, because when we hear the expression somebody with a disability, we always think of an experience that somebody else lives. And it's never a reality for us um, that could happen for us. We never think about that, do we? And most people who are disabled here on planet Earth were not born with a disability. They became uh, or they uh, became disabled because of an accident, as happened with me, or because of some violence, uh, be like Maria La Pena, or just because of degenerative disease. So the fact is, you could become a disabled person, or you could need more accessibility in your house, because uh, nowadays our uh, our life expectancy is much longer, so it's more likely that we will become more limited as we get older. Uh, but the fact is, we often think that when we talk about these things, we think it's specifically for disabled people only, rather than thinking that it's something that's important for everybody in society. I can't remember which, um, which person said that she lives in a house that used to belong to some elderly people and already bought the house adapted. Um, then there was uh, Layla who talked about her mother who's a wheelchair user and who had to adapt her home which is another impact of ableism on society which is a financial um, impact because if we'd already thought about these things before we built these buildings then she wouldn't have to pay so much out and um, suffer economically because of making these adaptations so this is what ableism is about I'd like to believe that when you do buy your homes um, is that you won't be able to deny me the invitation of coming to your home. But what I'm revealing to you is how ableism defines you. And maybe you think that you don't need to know Marcelo Zigi or, you know, have a relationship with him or anybody else who has a disability in society. That's what ableism is about. And that's what we need to talk about today and review. That's why we hear often that maxim because, oh, I'm not going to adapt my home because no disabled people come here. Maybe disabled people won't go to your home because it's not adapted for them. But the fact is that a lot of people with disabilities end up becoming recluses within their homes because if your buildings are not adapted for us, then ours are also not adapted for us. For us to get out of our homes is already a, a, an achievement. You need to understand we always face ableism as soon as we 
We think that ableism only happens when we leave our home, but no, that's not true. Ableism happens in our homes too. Um, we're not just talking about architecture here, uh, because uh, there are other barriers too. For example, how many news programs do you see with a Libra's interpreter? Think about all the information that is denied to 10 million Brazilians who have um, hearing impairments or who are deaf. We've just been through a critical moment about the pan with, during the pandemic where information was vital for people to survive, but this information was denied to this population. And if they didn't have other alternatives to be able to find and access information, maybe they wouldn't be here with us today. Talking about 10 million people who are deaf or who have some hearing impairment. So that also is ableism. It's very serious. I like to give you images because it's very difficult to think about ableism. The, the term in itself is still very new. So these images allow us to understand what our day-to-day -day routine is like and how it acts in our lives. And it's not just an issue of the person. Um, it's not, we're not just talking about people being ableist or not. Sometimes ableism is involuntary and unconscious in people. But we need to know about this information because it's affecting the lives of people, not just those people who are disabled, but people who are non-disabled. Did you put your hand up, Karina? Somebody could give her a microphone. I think you need to press the button now. Can you hear? So, I was really provoked by what you said and thought that seeing that we're at a congress about education, this is what occurred to me when you were talking about bathrooms. Why is it that on architectural courses or engineering courses, people who build our homes, why do they think about that? Why isn't that part of their discipline? Why isn't it within schools and within universities? So they can think about it before Zig or other, another person has an accident and becomes disabled. Why are we talking about it here at an educational conference? Maybe education could be more forward-thinking about these questions. It's going to be it's quite difficult for you to hear what I'm going to say now, and you're going to feel very uncomfortable. But the, the fact is that disabled people are still not seen as being human in society. They're destitute of any human characteristic. They're not part of um, people who are non-disabled, their lives. So if we were to do some research with social movements, if it hasn't been constructed by people who are disabled and who are deliberately looking for disabled people, you will not find disabled people. And what does that mean to the whole of society, including for people who are disabled? It means that people who are disabled aren't black, they're not women, they're not indigenous, they're not gay, they're nothing other than their disabilities. Lembram da da guerra da Ucrânia? 
Do you remember the war in Ukraine? We've got another war going on, and we've also forgotten about the war in Ukraine, and we've got non-declared wars that happen all around our planet Earth. But Ukraine has been at war for more than a year. How many news items have you read about people who are disabled in Ukraine who are stuck there? We've got a new war going on. Have you read articles about that? Have you read articles about people who are disabled in that war? In August, it was Father's Day. How often did you hear about fathers who are disabled? We're in October now. It's Children's Day in this month. How many campaigns did you see with children with disabilities? Have you noticed how invisible disabled people are? We're edited out of advertising campaigns and we're edited out of wars. And all of that happens within our own homes. It's the feeling of not belonging to any place in society. And this is a concept that I call social death. That's the experience that disabled people have in society. It's social death. Uh, the city council in Salvador did a campaign two or three years ago, and they talked about traffic accidents because they were trying to reduce the number of traffic accidents. And the campaign did the following thing. Um, it had a lot of outdoors, it included a lot of outdoors, and in the first half of the outdoor there was a motorcycle, or half of a motorcycle, and above that motorcycle there was something saying, your family needs you. And on the other side you had a wheelchair user. So what they're communicating there is that your family can no longer count on you. And here we're talking about traffic accidents that have killed more than all of the wars in humanity. But what's the worst thing that can happen to a person uh, in a traffic accident? Well, the worst thing is not dying. It's becoming somebody who will be disabled because that person will feel death in their lives. And that starts in our homes. So we talk a lot about inclusion, but to talk about inclusion, we need to start to debate exclusion as well. We have to understand exclusion in order to propose inclusion. We have not yet asked ourselves about what happened to people who were enslaved and who were disabled. We don't talk about that person who is, let's say, hit by a bullet and who doesn't die but becomes disabled. We don't talk about people who become disabled as a result of incorrect medical procedures. We don't talk about intersectionality and diversity in thinking about the experiences of people who are disabled. O microfone do palestrante está falhando. So there are affirmative actions for hiring disabled people and people who are LGBT. And society sometimes doesn't consider the fact that there are black people who are disabled and women who are disabled and LGBT people who are disabled. You have a whole mix of these characteristics of features who are disabled. So we talk about intersectionality, but only within this perspective of being disabled. So it's okay to be a woman, to be LGBT, or to be black, as long as you are a person without disabilities. 
se a gente não falar de exclusão. So if we don't talk about exclusion, how will we work towards inclusion? Because today we're still celebrating what we're celebrating in terms of inclusion is not really inclusion. I'm sorry to ruin your party. But what we have today is an inclusion. So how can we include, how can we have inclusion in society? Well, we reserve special places in our society so that disabled people can participate. So we do this in our buildings, in our special schools. We do this in the Paralympics. And we even do this in terms of um, priority service for the disabled. O áudio do palestrante está falhando. So, we create, we reserve special places for these people. So, what are we doing here? We are creating a special place, and we are identifying to the rest of society that those are places for people with disabilities. So, we're telling people that that specific place is where disabled people belong. And sometimes we don't even get priority services, because when we look at these cashiers, for example, what do we see? Well, a lot of times we see a huge line, a huge priority line, and when you have a long queue for priority service, you won't have priority service. Priority service is when a person receives a, a, a service immediately. So since we're talking about intersectionality, I, as a black man, I recognize that in our society, we're celebrating inclusion, but by means of another name, which is the delimitation of spaces in private and public spaces for the participation of certain people. But that's not inclusion, that's apartheid. So that's what we're celebrating. Inclusion will only occur when any person with a disability will have autonomy in relation to everyone else in society. We will not have inclusion any other way. We will have a legal relation where I will meet the demands of the law, but I won't have any expectation that that person with a disability will actually occupy a space. That's why we're not present in any architecture or engineering courses. So society has no expectations that these people with disabilities will actually occupy space places. There's no belief that these people with disabilities will be able to do anything. Ableism sells us this idea that these people are unable to do anything. So again, you know, why should we adapt a space so that that person may participate? And this term by itself, adaptation, tells us a lot. And it's unrelated to inclusion. If I need to adapt, it's because I'm assuming that there is already a pattern. It's a pattern of exclusion. It excludes people with disabilities. Has anyone here ever used an adapted bathroom? And don't worry, I'm not a cop. I'm not going to denounce any of you. But again, has anyone here ever used an, an adapted restroom? Do you remember whether, do you remember the feeling that you had when you went into the restroom? Did you feel more comfortable? Did you feel safer? Did you feel more autonomy when you were using that restroom? If so, then why is it that people with no disabilities accept not having that right assured to them? Why is it that all bathrooms are not adapted? If adapted restrooms promote more comfort and autonomy and safety, then why don't we have more of these restrooms around? In fact, if every bathroom is adapted, we will no longer need to use this term, right? Adapted. 
and we will be able to relate to the humanities of people with disabilities. But right now, we're having apartheid by means of inclusion. And now I want to go back about our relation to the laws. O áudio do palestrante está falhando, os intérpretes não estão conseguindo interpretar corretamente. A lot of times, these people don't have a way to leave their homes. And when they're able to reach a place that's been adapted, so for example, reserved parking spaces, so we have adapted elevators that are broken or that are always under maintenance. And accessible restrooms, when they're not locked, they're always being used as a warehouse. So again, this is the place of people with disabilities in society today. So not talking about this and not thinking about this will not make these people disappear. So I imagine the relation of society with disabled people the following way. It's almost as if people with disabilities were extraterrestrials and were visiting, and all of a sudden they decided to stay on this planet forever, and they were basically trying to get a visa to remain. And so society, in order to deal with the situation, decided to do what we used to do in the northeast of the country in the past, that is, when we received an unwanted visitor that we wanted to leave very quickly. So we would put a broomstick behind the door, and I can tell you that that does not work. So please don't invest your energy in these kinds of initiatives because they really don't work. People with disabilities have always existed in all of the history of humanity. So, unless humanity, unless humanity brings itself to extinction, people with disabilities will continue to exist. Because most of these people are not born with disabilities. The World Health Organization and the United Nations say that 80% of the world population that has a disability are people who became disabled. These are not people who were born with disabilities. And it's important for us to think about that because a black person is born black, a woman is born a woman, an LGBT person is born being LGBT, but a person with a disability was not necessarily born with that disability. So any person can become disabled at any moment in time. And I'm not trying to jinx you in any way with that comment just because of the fact that I became disabled. Because, again, I'm very comfortable with my situation. As I told you before, I, I've been through a lot of different experiences. And this morning, you know, I was uh, talking to my grandchild and he was asking me to come home. So again, the problem is not disability, and being having a disability is not a problem. The problem is not being able to be a person with a disability in our society. So that's the problem. We need to understand that we don't need to adapt spaces. We need to actually increase comfort, and we need to increase safety, and we need to increase autonomy. How many home accidents would we avoid in our restrooms at home if our restrooms were adapted, or if they were improved so that we could have more autonomy and more safety? 
microfone, gente. Eu já vi uma plaquinha passando ali. Okay, guys, well, I already saw somebody holding up a sign telling me my time is up. É, so, eu não vou me alongar porque tem I don't want to say much more because we've got a lot of more incredible people uh, ready to give their talk, but I would like to conclude uh, by singing. But look, I'm, I'm not going to perform uh, like what the actors from the play from earlier today did. Uh, what they did this morning was incredible. But, you know, I, I'm trying, I'm going to try and ruin your afternoon by by singing something, uh, a, a song that I adapted. There's a singer from Salvador called Azur Matumbi. He's a black man with a disability. And he wrote a song called 14 de Maio or May 14th. And basically he talks about the next day. What happened to the enslaved people the day after uh, the slaves were freed in Brazil? And uh, that's a topic for another Mas conversation, but eu fiz uma anyway, I modified the song to bring this idea of intersectionality of race and disability. So get ready and please be tolerant with me. No dia 13 de maio não pude sair. So on the 13th of May I couldn't não leave my house. Permaneço aqui. I don't have accessibility so I remain Preso in my house. I am stuck janela. to ableism without a ramp or without a window um and I'm dreaming about the day when I will be able to come and go. No dia 13 de maio, on the 13th of May, sair. I couldn't leave my house. Não tem acessibilidade, I have aqui. no accessibility, so I remain Mesmo here, stuck in janela. ableism, without Sendo a ramp and without a window, um dreaming about the day when I'll be able to come and go. I get dizzy without knowing who I am. That's my agony. At night, I'm black, but during the day, I'm a person with a disability. Without a home, without humanity, without citizenship, the world is always dislocating me to a place of no belonging. On the 13th of May, nobody cared about me. I'm always a cripple in terms of living, and there's no inclusion at work or at school. Everybody believes that I was only born to suffer, but my soul wants to keep fighting. I want what's good for me as a black person with a disability. The correct body is the one that doesn't adjust itself. I am who I am, and now I love my being. Were you able to understand my message? Pay attention to the black person with a disability. Pay attention to me now that you see me, and look how beautiful I am, and now look how beautiful we are as a united people. It's, this brings us a lot of pleasure. My heart is open, and my suffering is genuine. Were you able to understand my message? Pay attention to the black person with a disability. Pay attention to the black person with a disability now that you see me. Look how beautiful I am. And look how beautiful our united people are. This is a pleasure for all of us, and my heart is open, and my suffering is real. My lament is genuine, people. My lament is genuine, people. Thank you.
honra. What an honor. Marcelo, que honra poder ouvir um pouquinho de você. It was an honor, Marcelo, to hear you. Vamos ter você aqui durante os três dias. It's great that we're going to have you here for three years, uh, three weekdays, rather, as our MC. And it's really urgent for us to rethink the idea of inclusion. Mas é, fica a reflexão, so it's a luta for us pela inclusão, a luta anti-capacitista e anti-racista deve ser de todos nós. Anti-ableism e a limitação não é da pessoa com deficiência, a limitação é da sociedade. A limitation é of disabled people, it's a limitation of é society, nós que não nos us who have power, those who are in power. Então, que so we need to take up this. Um congresso só para ter um This fight. So it's not a congress just for us to get a certificate and say, hey, look, we were here. It needs to be a movement of awakening our awareness. So we put the QR code on the screen so that you can confirm that you've been here. And now we're going to have other QR codes for each talk. Vou passar a palavra para But o now I'm going to ilustre mestre de cerimônia. Ask our Muito obrigada mais uma dear and illustrious MC um, to Bom, speak é, a little bit more now. Vamos agora à primeira mesa de diálogo. So let's have the first round table about affirmative action and uh, decolonial decolonialism. So e doutorando em sociologia pela Unicamp ask Isaac, the PhD Isaac student Isaka Mainasara. I'm sorry if I've got your name wrong. From the from Sao Paulo and from the Afro Xangô group and from the National International Institute Against Racism, Carlos Alvarez Nazareno. Bueno, hola, hola, hola. ¿Se escucha bien? Bueno, buenas tardes para todas, para todos, para todos. So, good afternoon. I hope you can hear me well. It's a pleasure to be here in this marvelous city. And I'd like to begin with a lesson that I had today, which is the audio description that people are giving so that we're more inclusive. So I'm Carlos Alvarez Nazareno from Argentina. I'm an Afro-Argentinian man with dreadlocks. I'm tall. Estoy vestido con un pantalón negro y un saco and también de color negro con algunos I'm using black trousers and a uh, jacket with orange patterns and it's a real pleasure to be here. And I'd like to thank Seski for inviting me, uh, who are great partners in this fight in education. And I'd also like to thank Roberto Borges for this, com for this invitation. I'd also like to thank all of you for being here today. And I'd also like to thank Claudia Miranda, a teacher who's also part of this fight, anti-racism fight. So the reason why I've been asked was to talk a little bit um, from an anti-racist point of view and a decolonial point of view about education and about the experience that we been through in Argentina. As you know, historically, Argentina 
is or likes to think of itself as a white European country, the France of Latin America, making black people invisible. As well as indigenous people who are also invisible. So that's why it's so important for us to show you our existence and our resistance as Afro descendants in this territory. Before I start talking, though, I'd also like to mention something else. I'd like to talk about where I come from. So the perspective we're going to bring you today is from the African diaspora because those of us who are descendants um, of Africa are the consequence of enslavement and we spent years and years fighting for justice, for recognition, and for development. Those are three premises, justice, recognition, and development. And these are hugely important for any Afro-descendants. And we'd like to um, oblige states to put into practice what they have promised for our communities and for our peoples. And we are trying to push the UN to help us bring this recognition forward for our people. And our participation society has a lot to do with social movements and anti-racist social movements. Brazil has got a lot of history, lots of people and organizations of reference within sociology and education, and the fight against racism is important here, and Argentina has also been involved in this fight. I'd also like to recognize Maria uh, Barchi Rojas, who is a black woman who was made invisible through Argentina's historiography. historiography. She died two years ago, but we need to recognize her fight in making Afro-Argentinians more visible in society. So we want to encourage an anti-racist and anti-colonial education. From an intersectional point of view, and we hope that intersectionality will become more present in our in in all areas of life, but especially in education as well. We want to be able to have more uh, content which is related to anti-racism. And we want more brothers and sisters who are Afro-descendants working as teachers and as researchers. So we are fervent defenders of affirmative action in education policy. Brazil has been a place of reference for us, and that's why we're very happy to be here again. And we're also very happy with the return of Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva as president.
Con él y con Dilma empezaron las acciones afirmativas en el campo educativo. Because it was with him that affirmative actions began in education in Brazil, and it's we've got clear political and institutional signs how this has worked. We're very proud of having a minister um, like Margaret Chimenezes, uh, an Afro-Brazilian, and Minister Almeida as well, who is the Minister for Racial Equality, and so many other public figures. La construcción política y el despertar de las conciencias es con the idea is that with them we'll be able to awaken people's awareness so that we can become protagonists in this fight. And we tienen que poder pensar en sus privilegios. And we want white or non-Afro-descendants can think about the privileges that they have and give voice and give a place as protagonists to other people. We don't want to be objects of study, but subjects who deserve rights and who deserve a decolonial education. But we don't want to just research ourselves, we want to research the impact of racism in the classroom and prepare teachers to be able to deal with racism, discrimination that happens in every single classroom, in every single class. Because all of us across the country have experienced that in Latin America. And we're part of a group, Shango, which fights for social justice and inclusion for Afro-descendants and for immigrants and LGBTQI people, because intersectionality for us is a tool for this fight is not just symbolic, and our movement has developed many actions that I'd like to tell you about today. So the idea of endo-education, of, of endo-educationists, endo educationalists who are black, who can help um, and we'd like to sort of work with those educators here in Rio de Janeiro. We've developed many educational manuals for teaching staff so that they have the tools to train and educate people. So other perspectives are possible if we empower our young children, young people. And that's why it's great to see so many young people here and so many people of diverse racial backgrounds because it's in public education where our families and our communities are present. So listen, we're not talking about a competition, or rather somebody talked about the competition between public education and private education, but there can be, they can complement each other. and. We can support each other, and it's important, as it was said in the in the morning, we talked about our starting points, and unfortunately, for black people, we don't start from the same place. That's why it's important for us to know and understand that we are poor because we are black and because there wasn't a system to include us that was dem democratic and particip participatory to generate equal conditions for us. 
That's why one of our challenges is to understand the strategi strategies of the colonizers and think of education as something that needs to be decolonial and anti-racist, generating pedagogical materials that can support this and generate as well in all educational spaces the possibility for participation by everybody. So in sociology, we're looking at this problem, we're looking at different forms of organizing society and make this Global South paradigm evident uh, within this anti-racist fight. Our fight is intersectional and this this creates, and this started really in 2001 in the third global conference um, in South Africa in combating racism. We say that we entered that conference as black people, but we left as Afro-descendants because the idea of being Afro-descendant emerged in a decolonial, um, in this decolonial experience, because this started our our journey started long before colonialism. This is fundamental. And we also talk a lot here in the Global South about colorism. And in Brazil, we talk about education for black people, for mixed race people, and so on. We've managed to combat this idea of using the words morena and morena, which were also words for mixed race people. Uh, but were problematic. And in Paraguay, there is a concept of brown using the word marron. And, but we're very critical about the, this concept because this is going back to colorism. And it's a colonial point of view. The color of our skin has nothing to do with our ancestry. And with that color, because we are um, Afro descendants. So, from the intercultural point of view and the educational point of view, we'd like to look at our ancestry rather than our color. And that's why our objective is to construct spaces and processes, educational processes that are heterogeneous and, and look at different methodologies and epistemologies that are anti-racist and can have an impact politically on different spheres of society, not just within the government, within governments, but in all areas of society, have new um, regulations and guidelines for education, which has a decolonial perspective and is anti-racist and feminist as well and in constructing knowledge. And to conclude, and again, because I think it's important for us to ask questions and interact, I'd like to say that Argentina is also Afro. I think these ideas of exclusion that are part of our people, such as Uruguay, Argentina, and Paraguay, where, you know, Afro-descendants are invisible, I think these people should become visible. And these people, for us, are not the future, they're the present, and we think that they need to incorporate this narrative of struggle. These people need to feel proud of themselves, and they need to feel proud of their ancestors. These people should be leaders and references in our communities. 
These people should fight for an inclusive education, an education that will foster participation. I would like us to have more teachers, more researchers, more PhD candidates and more master students who are Afro-descendants, people who are black and who are proud of their identity. And that's why I thank you for the invitation to be here talking to you about this. I really think we should strengthen this exchange uh, regionally. I think it's fundamentally important for us to have more spaces like SESC because the creation of partnerships will will allow us to strengthen our democracies. That's because the fight against racism and the fight for end of education doesn't just, uh, doesn't just involve people who are racialized. It sh this is a struggle that should involve everyone. So thank you very much, and now I'm available to answer your questions. Boa tarde a todas, a todos e a todos. Vocês estão me ouvindo bem? So my colleague here um, gave a great speech. I'd like to thank him. And I'd also like to thank Marcelo Zig for his incredible talk. And it made me think about a lot of different things and about how we can how we can make people comfortable, that is, uh, people with disabilities. So I'd like to thank SESC for the invitation to be here, to be a part of this conference. And I would also like to thank Adriano and Priscila, who were always available to answer my questions. But again, before all that, I'd like to uh, give my talk. I am Isaka. I live in Brazil. I'm a country uh, called Niger. Uh, whenever I say I'm from Niger, people ask me, oh, you're from Nigeria? I say, no, I'm from Niger. Um, it was in the news in the last few days or weeks because there was a coup d'etat there. Not just in Niger, but in other countries uh, in the sub-Saharan region. I think when we think about decolonial education, what should we think about? Well, decolonial education is an education that proposes different ways of thinking and different ways of contributing with knowledge. And the idea here is that people should think about these all of the different issues based on their experiences. So I'm going to talk about my own experiences. So in 2019, I was a part of a project where I was supposed to uh, follow what was going on in Democratic Republic of the Congo. In that country, there's a conflict in the south. There's a conflict that's been going on there for quite a while. And the United Nations is working in that region. And this, in this project that I was in, my role was to accompany the implementation of education policies in regions that had been stabilized and where the conflict had already been resolved. So what we realized in, in this project is the following. When we talk about decolonial education, we're talking about education, a contribution to education based on the experience of people who are in that region. So what did the UN do? They hired two very experienced educators, one from Canada and another one from the United States. You know, and these were from, uh, you know, this, this educator from the United States was from Harvard. And so they went to Africa, Democratic Republic 
of Congo, and they thought uh, about policies in the region. So they thought about different projects, and they were in, in these communities. So they were in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, in the south of the country, in an area called Kivu. And they tried the pro to implement a project there, but it didn't work out. So in our conversations with people from that region, one of the complaints was that these people never got in touch with them to understand the needs of the local communities. So I think that that is one mistake. So I'm always talking with people who are doing uh, ex on exchange programs or with people who are traveling, and I always talk about how when you reach a different place, it's important for you to interact with the community. When you arrive at a country that has just experienced an internal conflict, or that's still uh, having uh, that is still having problems. If you arrive there with a program that you're trying to implement, you should talk to the local community. And so, in this case, the local community was not consulted. And two or three years after the project started, it came to an end. And you know, people say that the, the local people were not interested. And they would say that it was difficult to implement this project, this educational project. And you would see a lot of different excuses. So when we think about decolonial education, this is basically an education that thinks about different ways of teaching, different ways of thinking, and this is all based on the perspective of different people. It's not just a Paulo Freire perspective. And, I, and just as an aside, I really like Paulo Freire's work, but this is, you know, this is what ends up happening because these people were bringing, uh, trying to implement a project without consulting with the local population to understand what their needs were. So I'm from Niger, from Niger, and in my PhD, I study African countries, especially Francophone African countries. And for those of you who don't, who don't know, the experience in relation to education in these Francophone countries uh, they they are a result of uh, French colonization. So you had the French missionaries who arrived in Africa and they created the first schools and they trained the first teachers. And they would train teachers in cities such as Paris and other cities in France. And, the ex and then you had these people going back to Africa and these would then train and teach the population. So one thing that we always think and talk about is how to think about an African education based on the experiences of African countries. Uh, when I was in primary school and high school, in Niger, in my geography classes, we had a lot of different classes about European and French geography. There were French literature classes. We read all of their books. But we had very few books written by African authors. When I became interested in literature, I started working with literature. And I can say that today, today the education rate is low, so the literacy rate is low. We're talking about 38%, 40%, 45%. I think in Brazil the number is 83%, just for you guys, 
for you to guys have an idea how our literacy rate is low in those African countries. And one of the things that we talk about in this field, one of the things that we ask ourselves is why do people read don't, why don't people read that much? Well, it's because only a small percentage of the population is literate. So again, a small percentage of the population is able to read a book. And that's why we have so few readers in those areas. In all of these African countries, Niger, Mali, Togo, Benin, Senegal, Ivory Coast, in all of these countries, the literacy rate is not above 50%. So it's at most 45, 46, or 47 percent. So again, why should we be talking about a country where only 40 or 45 percent or 35 percent of the population is able to read and write? If I go to any one of these countries, let's say Niger, in Niger, 37 to 38 percent of the people there are able to read and write. Sometimes you'll find people who are able to speak French and they never attended school because they learned French in their everyday lives. They, got, they, 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 they were in contact with people who spoke French. But in these countries, you have other languages, such as local languages, Hausa, Jarma, and 90% of the population speaks these local languages. Now, if 37 or 38% of the population doesn't speak French, that means that they don't have access to a whole range of things. So, for example, let's think about a newspaper. Or, or, or news program, a 9 p.m. news program. These programs have to be in three languages, so Jarma, Hausa, and French, so that the whole population may be able to understand what's being said. And if this program is not being transmitted in, in, in these languages, then only a small percentage of the population will, will understand what's being said. So in the last few years, what authors have been doing is they've been creating soap operas, or they've been uh, basing them, uh, they've been working with novels to turn them into soap operas uh, written in the local language. And that way, a larger number of people would have access to that material. The languages used in these African countries, uh, there's, there's an interesting issue related to these languages. There's a lot of effort being implemented in schools such as Senegal and Ivory Coast and in Mali. We have a lot of schools that teach Bambara or Alofi or Serer, which are local languages. And in Mali, you have a Bambara in Niger. At the National Museum, there's a school that's focused on teaching local languages. And when I say this, it's not that I'm against uh, educating people in these languages. I'm in favor of education. So when people... I'm not against education. I just believe that the more people who have access to education, especially in Africa, if we consider problems such as, you know, uh, poverty, 
and other issues, all of that is in some way linked to the access or to lack of access uh, to education, such as lack of schools, lack of specific training. After colonization ended, when these countries became independent, and even those countries that were colonized by uh, Portugal, when all of these countries became independent, a lot of intellectuals and writers had to leave those countries and they had to go to, let's say, Portugal or the uh, or England and other countries that were colonized by the United Kingdom, or they would have to go to countries that were colonized by France, such as Niger. And so they had to go to a big metropolis in France to be able to graduate in any um, subject, really. And those educators who have a very important role when we think about being black, these educators, they went to France. Why? Because to a certain degree, the basic, basically they didn't have the um, the first uh, French-speaking um, university in Africa was in 1964, which is very recent. So um, if people wanted to graduate, they had to get a grant to go to another country, uh, such as France, and go to a city there, and which was a case of Sheikh Kanjiop, Mingo Chipi, and various other African intellectuals. So, now that I've talked about these intellectuals, you have to think about the mobilization they had to do to be able to think about an education that's decolonial, because they had to bring a new perspective from their own experiences, because when Leon Damasa, Leopassar Sandor, MSZ um, talk about being black, they're thinking about being black as an experience which will um, break down stereotypes challenge them. So Leopoldo, for example, gave an interview and they asked him, why? What is being black for you? And he said, well, when we came here um, to Europe and France specifically, they used to say that African um, countries didn't have anything, didn't produce science, music, art, culture, any type of knowledge. And they were only dancers and etc. And so, because of this Eurocentric view of an of an Africa that was exactly the same from north to south, which is crazy, because we laugh and say sometimes people think that Africa is one country only, and that's why we decided to write and produce. Um, material to show the multiplicity that exists there and the importance of the knowledge there, our experiences too, and all the wealth that exists within Africa. I, I like some Fernanda Albuquerque de Moral from USP um, used to say that Africa is rich, multicultural, multi-ethnic, multi-religious, lots of multiple um, factors there which are produced within the continent as a result of the experiences of the people who live there. I'm going to... So 
And now I'd like to talk a little bit about literature, which is my background. There's a book that's really interesting from the godfather of um, Nigerian, Shinwa Shebi, of, sorry, of Nigerian literature. And the, this novel that he wrote shows is a clear example what African countries are like before white men arrived there. It's about, it's very sh about 130 or 140 pages are dedicated to describing a Ibu community in Nigeria where there was polit politics, there was economy, education, all the structures that society had created like all other societies. Of course, every society has conflicts and challenges and it, their, its own faults, but when he shows all the wealth with, within his novel about the world falling apart, he shows what it was like and what happened after white men arrived. Um, we talk about specifically the British Empire, I almost said the White Empire, but for specifically when the British Empire arrived in Nigeria and how it took down all these structures that was already extremely well organized. And so one of the lessons so if we have some faults within our society, the people who have to resolve those problems are the people within that society or community. Because sometimes you know, people come and try and from the outside and, and resolve them. How can they? So now I'd like to talk a little bit about my um, my uh, my experiences here in Brazil. I've been here for quite a while. I'm really sorry because I haven't given my audio description yet. I'm a black man, an African man. I'm uh, wearing some jeans and a Converse trainers. I'm not sure what the color of my uh, shirt is, but it's kind of orange with like white stripes. But I've always liked, I've always liked working in projects ever since, you know, even in Niger, I used to work in lots of different projects. So my, one of the first projects I worked in was one that was trying to combat the desertification of our country. Niger is much is a huge country, but has a small population. It's about 20 million, but at least 10 percent of our uh, land is desert, and it has advanced quite a lot because of the climate crisis. Crisis. And uh, it's always been advancing ever since I have lived there. So, so this movement was against desertification. And when I came to Brazil, I did international relations and obviously automatically I started go joining new projects about education. And uh, in these projects, there were always there were always issues that we needed to discuss. We talk about issues specific to Brazil and other ones specific to children, adolescents, and re refugees from other uh, countries like Angola, Syria, and the Demo Democratic Republic of Congo. And we also used to ask similar questions. And I'd like to put these questions to you, and then I'll. So the questions we asked were, 
So, so education has to have some space for training where historical awareness is strengthened or reviewed and revised. When I talk about reviewing or revising history, one of the symbols that has been divulged around Brazil is is to go back to the past to understand the present and be able to signify the future. So education is important for this movement. So the questions that I make, why should we educate people? We need to think about that. Think about students and future educators. Why should we educate? Because it goes much, it goes well beyond education in within four walls. How about education as people or as parents, children, sons, daughters, colleagues, bosses? It's to compensate, assimilate, reproduce, or indoctrinate. So in Brazil, he's the talker is, speaker is talking a little bit far from his microphone. So is it to is it to make to create differences or to create culture? So I left Niger and came to Brazil and continued studying ever since I've come here. Is it to tolerate or to prevent racism and intolerance? When we think of racism, what is the function of education? Is it to tolerate other races? Is it to understand the other? In literature, there's a movement that we have. Maybe you know Antonio Cândido, who's got a great text, which is the right to literature. He says that it's a basic necessity. It doesn't depend on your background, your class, your race. Everybody needs to have access to literature. And in my experiences in schools since I arrived here in Brazil, I've always worked with education, but I'm focused at the moment uh, on the public system within Sao Paulo. So I give training to teachers, workshops for students, and I always say that the following. Within literature, education has a role which is crucial because the first time that I went into schools in Sao Paulo State and thinking about education laws in Brazil, I asked them, why don't you address subjects related to Afro-Brazilians and Africa within the classroom? Um, but mainly, I talked about Africa, obviously, being African. My interest was to be able to... My aim was to be able to sort of talk to teachers within these schools about education, about African education, about African culture. They said to me, well, we'd be interested in doing that, but the, the way we were trained is that we didn't have any discipline or any subjects about this, about African cultures. And what about African literature? Surely you must have access to it. No, we don't have it. We've got some books at school, but we don't know where to start. So that was why I decided to do a project that was financed by the state government in Sao Paulo, was to be able to give a course to teachers in four schools from that region. 
state schools, that is. And after this, the aim of the project was to then basically re renovate the libraries within the system because it's difficult to be able to teach students or teachers about African literature if they haven't got any access to that literature. Because if I'm going to go to a school where the libraries have got very few works by African authors, it's going to be difficult. And one of the arguments that I used in the project was that it, it's, it's difficult to demand that somebody um, who lives in a deprived neighborhood buys a book that cost, costs 40 or 50 reais um, for them to read. We know that books are expensive, and this book that I mentioned, Things Fall Apart by Shinwa Achebe, it's expensive. So it's very difficult to encourage somebody to read or be interested in lit African literature if they can't access those books. And it's even more difficult if the teacher who gives those classes who's giving classes to adolescents and young people, and they also haven't had access to this literature or these works or hasn't been taught about them. And our experience with literature shows us that we need to have engagements and interaction, not just between teach uh, students, but also between people that had training in this area, because whenever I'm going to talk about a specific work, I need to give context. I need to talk about the writer. And it's also interesting to talk about uh, their experience. It would also be interesting to talk about the country where that book was written. It would be interesting to talk about a lot of different things, but it's not always possible to do this. And my colleague just told me that my time is up. Yes. <laughs> So, there are other things that I wrote down here, but we can uh, talk about uh, this uh, as our conversation continues. So, I'd like to thank you once again for your presence. And I was really happy to see a lot of young people here, a lot of teenagers. I think we've got people here from high school. And I know that it's in São Paulo, I know that FUVEST and UNICAMP have some of these books uh, that I mentioned. So, again, this conversation is really important. So, thank you. Estaba bueno ahora este momento si podemos compartir alguna pregunta y también saludar además a Adriano, Alexandra y a Regina por la invitación. Okay, so now we would like to thank Adriano. Hay alguna de las imágenes que habíamos propuesto. I think we've got a PowerPoint here that we can open up so that we can have a debate. La Afro Argentinidad en rostro. We had some images that we decided to include for you to see some faces from um, African authors.
esto fue una asamblea de mujeres afroargentinas. So here we have a picture este of a gathering of Argentinian women. Afro. So on the, this happened on the 25th of July, which was a day of African women. And here you can see the diversity within the Afro-Argentinian community. So we have issues about whiteness, blackness, and other topics. We also had Epsi Campbell Bar, the president of the Permanent Forum of Afro Descendants of the United Nations. And we've got people here from different provinces of Argentina, provinces where a lot of the people consider themselves to be Afro-Argentinians. Here we have immigrant colleagues. And here you can see different generations of Afro-Argentinians. Some people say that they don't exist, but here you can see how not all Argentinians are white. So we had this meeting at the Conference of Nations. And one of the things that we're pressuring uh, the public authorities to do is the creation of laws, of specific laws. Unfortunately, the Argentinian government is not focused on the issues that we would like them to focus on. Here we have representatives from the different um, public agencies. We've got the intersectionality of the LGBT community. Here we have a regional coordinator. And here we're talking about the recognition of the Afro-Argentinian population. Here we've got more young Afro-Argentinians. Esta fue una mirada del Congreso para que Lucía Molina, una gran referente. Here we've got Lucía Molina, who's a reference in terms of Afro-Argentinian history. Bueno, ahí tenemos a la interventora del INADI. Here we've got somebody from Inaji and some other colleagues. So let's go to a question from the floor. Uh, the interpreters don't have access to the audio coming from the person in the audience. We don't know what she's asking. Didn't. The interpreters cannot hear the questions that are being asked. Os intérpretes não conseguem ouvir as perguntas que estão sendo feitas. Good afternoon. I would like to thank you for your talk. It was great to be able to hear what you guys uh, had to say. Now I'd like to ask two questions. The first question to Carlos. Here in Brazil, it's difficult to have different implementations related to history. Even with the laws that we have, we see a lot of difficulty in implementing the law that you mentioned. And within schools, history is always considering European history. We talk, talk very little about Brazilian history and the history of Latin America as a whole. So we have this law. And so how, how does this happen in Argentina? Because you say that people there are made invisible. So how does anti-racism education occur there? 
And for Isaac, I want to ask a question also thinking along the lines of education. What story is told? Because from what I understood, few people have access to formal education and literacy. So in Niger and in other African countries, such as the Congo, how is history taught? Because in my experience, history is always taught from a European perspective. So I'd like to know if in the schools that you had access to, they teach history thinking about Africa and this forced diaspora. So thank you very much. I think we have more questions from this sector here. So the social movements are an educating force. There's a really important book from 2016 that talks about the educating black movement. And we've been, we've been discussing this during teacher training. There's this idea that social movements, the movements of people without land and the movement of people uh, for feminism, all of these social movements provide our source of education. So I've been working with other sorts of education. So I'd like to congratulate both of you because you are linked to all of these social movements. So you're talking to us about other forms of education. And this brings to my mind Neuma and this idea that social movements are educators and they educate people. So I understand this and I talk about this in teacher training. I think it's a privilege to have access to social movements and it's a privilege to work with social movements. Katerina Walsh has this experience. She's a person from the United States who goes to Ecuador and decides to work with indigenous and Afro communities. So she works with these people and she engages with these people and re does research with these people. So I'd like Isaac to talk about this, the importance of this because you are at the European periphery. So I think that's a privilege. You were able to grow because of your contact with these people. I know it's happening with the Shango occupation, and I know that Carlos has been seeking resources from presidents of different countries. And they've been taking teenagers to the United States. And that creates a lot of comp uh, impact. The Shango occupation has been doing a lot in Argentina. So, you know, the families over there, they say, oh my God, my son is going to go on an airplane and is going to go to the United States and they're going to get to see other social movements. So I'd like you to talk a, a little bit about this movement and how much you respect you've been gaining, not just here in Brazil, but at the UN, because of your way of considering different forms of education. So I'd like to thank you for everything that you've been said for everything you've been saying, and, and I'd like to thank you for helping me to unlearn. Okay, so let's answer these questions really quickly because we don't have a lot of time. I'd like to thank you for your question. Racism in Argentina has a lot of different facets. And I think the most common one is the following. Whenever we talk about Afro-Argentinians, we can think about um, racism in language. 
Oh, I work with a black person, for example. And people always use the word quilombo there as something uh, in a negative way. And we're, when we're in public spaces, we're talking about uh, the impunity of whiteness, because any white person can go there, can go to these spaces and ask people where they're from. If you're white, because if you're dark, you're not considered the Argentinian. Argentinian. There are Argentinian Afro-descendants who, who call out uh, the, these offenses in the streets because in the 90s, it was thought that these women, these Afro-descendants, Argentinian Afro-descendants, were prostitutes. So there was this element of racism and this element of invisibilization, because all of the political references were white. And there was this, always this idea that Argentinians are descendants of Europeans. But again, Argentinians don't consider the slave ships that brought different people to Argentina. So these are some ways that racism shows its face in the country. I think we also we should also recover the African element in the country. In Argentina, institutional racism is very strong. And, you know, we're working with teacher trade unions in order to train them and create new teaching material. And then we have this question about interventions. Um, the Shango, in relation to the Shango occupation, we try to work with these populations to work with gender perspective and sexual diversity, and we've been working with young people as well. We've been trying to train young people. This is something that we've been focused on. By doing this, we create a network of young Afro-Argentinians and Afro-descendants. Because in the last 20 years in Argentina, we've been seeing a lot of immigration from African countries to Argentina. So we're working on these networks of young Afro-descendants and Afro-Argentinians. And we've also been working on different exchange programs so that these young people can visit universities in the United States. By doing the, this, these young Afri Argentinian Afro-descendants are able to go on a plane and get to see a different culture. And they're also able to represent their own community abroad. A lot of families say that, you know, this is the first time that their children is going abroad and uh, and representing the country. So this, uh, we try to include affirmative action in the sense. So to conclude, I think that uh, our fight is well articulated in the whole region. So we're always working in, uh, with different networks, with Afro-Brazilian networks and the Uruguayan Afro-Brazilian networks, and we work with the whole of Latin America and the Caribbean. The African movement in Latin America has always had been strongly involved in fighting racism in the continent, and we going to continue working with that and fortunately with the change in the political guard in Brazil and in Colombia these movements in Brazil and Colombia have re-emerged they were references um, for us thank you very much Por favor, aqui, à sua esquerda. So, could I just add something else? I'm Zio Zinocense, and 
So you said that you work with projects um, within public education and sometimes students don't have access to reading or teachers. Um, so I wanted to talk about a different um, thing in terms of in the academic world with teachers who teach physics and chemistry, how, how do they talk about the anti-racial content within their fields? And do you have any data to show us or share with us about the private system? I'm talking here about schools rather than higher education. Thank you. Thank you for your question. So, I'll first give some comments and then I'll reply to the woman teacher who made a, uh, who asked a question earlier. So. You talked about anybody who works in education in an anti-racist way will know that it's very difficult to think about this struggle without it being in tandem with um, social movements and black movements because there is a, there's a, almost like a dispute between academics and the black movements in terms of who began it, who started this fight, um, who has managed um, all the achievements. And so this, I don't like gossiping, but I'm going to just tell you about one specific case here, which um, made things very clear to me. I know Kabele Mulanga, I am in contact with him, and there was a ceremony for him to become the Professor Emeritus of USP. He was the first black anthropologist at USP University, USP University um, in the anthropology department. And the second one, who is younger, called Jefferson, came into the university 30 years after um, the first one had entered. So it's a very well-known course, the anthropology, but we only have two teaching teachers, rather professors, who talk about black matters, black issues, and anti-racial issues. And we know that there's a lot of resistance to affirmative action like specific quotas for places and so on. So when he had his ceremony to become the Professor Emeritus at the university, just remembering that this gossip <laughs> can't be, um, oh no, it's being recorded, isn't it? But I really don't want you to tell people about this. But this professor gave a beautiful speech and even though um, it appears to be this university is not progressive because it had, it took 30 years since Professor Kalenge was um, admitted to the department to get another black uh, professor within the faculty. And so somebody else, another member of the teaching staff, stood up and said, well, You've got to take into consideration that this space that we conceded to him as intellectuals and researchers um, shows that we are progressive and, you know, we have. So, I think there is a bit of a dispute, really, between black movements and the world of academia, but all our achievements in, um, in terms of anti-racism 
has to always be thought of or, um, in tandem with black movements, including other movements as well, like rap movements and so on. So in the districts where I work, in the periphery, uh, where I've been working for about five or six years, there's always there's always been a passion. I've always had this passion, not just for giving talks, but also to teach things that I like to learn about and research about. I did international relations, but I've, I've studied and taken part in meetings about literature. I've debated about ethnic and ethno-racial issues, and there were always people there from NGOs, there were also other students who had interest in these subjects, and through these experiences, I noticed that some spaces could be occupied, and we could try and do things differently. The first project that we did were projects that weren't specifically about um, education or in schools, they were in cultural spaces, cultural centers, in debates, soirees, but all of them were focused on talking about the African continent. And then I did a master's in education in Unicamp University. And then after this experience, I began working in schools and had meetings with teachers and principals and coordinators. And I've always noticed there's been a genuine interest and a very strong interest from everybody there, especially from young people. So I've, made, I've given talks at big schools with 1,200, 1,300 students, with all of them very much paying attention, participating. The teachers afterwards send, us message, send me messages, want to know more, ask for advice. So my literature is more adult literature, let's say, for not really for young people or for children. But then because obviously with this um, contact with schools, I researched sort of children's literature from African authors. Because quite often I had this feedback that people really enjoyed what I said and the time that I dedicated to it, but that they wanted this access to children's literature to be able to teach their children, their students. I, I think my time is up, unfortunately. Uh, when I answer a question, I end up getting a little bit lost in what I'm saying and don't end up finishing. Can you hear me? I think you can hear me now, yeah? <laughs> so I, I was saying thank you for your what you've talked about and for the work that you're developing. And while you were talking, I was thinking here about something. 
o lema da pessoa com deficiência, né? I thought about the motto of people with disabilities, which is nothing about us without us. E lembrando de algumas experiências também de And que houveram parcerias, né, entre pessoas negras e pessoas com deficiência. Thought about the partnerships that have been with between black people and disabled people, um, some of them really emblematic. Uh, one of them was a documentary called Trip Tempi, which talks a little bit about um, the political movement of disabled people in the US, and the Black Panthers were fundamental to help them to sustain their political acts. So there were other alliances as well, but there it was incredible the support that the Black Panthers gave there. And nothing about us without us it is a motto that came from South Africa between the partnership from the partnership between black people and disabled people who joined together to fight apartheid. And, and in 1981, the UN made it the year of uh, dis disabled people and and then and South Africa at that time didn't involve it, um, but then a few years later decided to have a disability year without consulting people with disabilities. So there were, were lots of protests against this and black people joined that movement. So that's where that motto came from, nothing about us without us. And we're not talking about this, talk about disabled people in one in, in one place and society in another place. Um, so the fact is it's important for us all to be together debating um, our humanity within society. So there's a clear link and direction um, and it's completely in line with the purpose of this Congress. So thank you, Isaac and Carlos, for the work um, that you do, for what you s talked about. I'd like to get to know you better, and I'd like to participate in your movements too. So carrying on, what are we going to have now? <laughs> So now we've got the launch of our journal, our virtual journal Humanos. So let's talk a little bit about this and let's call onto the stage the education journalists Adriana Rosca, Bernardo de la Veja and Ana Paula Simonacci. So I'm Adriano Rocha, I'm educational journalist from Sesky Rio, and I work with Bernardo. I'm going to do my audio description. I'm a black man, I'm 37 years old, I'm 182 tall, I'm using a black blazer with a white uh, shirt and a black trousers and white trainers. It's a real pleasure to be here this afternoon to launch this journal. So it was conceived by Jenny uh, Nobrega. Uh, so please give her a round of, of applause. She's on leave at the moment, but she's watching online. And it's important that we are committed to our three pillars here in Seski Hills Education Department, which are fundamental to all the actions that we do in education, which is anti-ableism, anti-racism, and 
scientific literacy. Thinking about the latter, we've got a project. I don't know if you're aware of this, but we do work with science and technology here in SESC. And we've got a project here that's in 17 of our centers around the state of Rio within so we take activities um, to do with scientific literacy and inclusion, digital inclusion, that is, to territories that are far flung within the state where the state has difficulty um, in arriving, in, in reaching, or where their actions are mainly violent ones. So it was Hejani who created this. She's been here for more than 20 years in Seski. She started with environmental education, and then she went to the project to do with the free internet and with all these advances in technologies. We turned this department into art and technology. In art and technology thinking about how to promote um, science socially and culturally. And the idea is to bring ordinary people close to, to scientific thinking and help them to understand that everybody produces science and science is part of our day-to-day -day life. So we have a project with lots of different activities, uh, different styles, and some of our products. Um, I will talk about them. Papo Ciencia, which was Barnard was in charge of and won awards this year. And we're going to have a third season of that. And another product is this journal, Humanos, which we're launching today. Um, we're launching it on our site. So this emerged because um, to, to show how computers and how knowledge moves us and transforms us and transforms the world. So Humanos um, brings together different artists, researchers and scientists with contemporary subjects and each person brings their own vision and opinion based on these subjects that we look at. It's a publication that it's bi-monthly, it's virtual as well, and, and so the, this is our third edition of it. Uh, we launched one last year in the Congress with Ailton Krenaki, and today we're launching it on our site. So before we continue, Ana Paula is going to talk a little bit about the curatorship process. But before this, we have a message here that we'd like to share with all of you. The Humanos magazine arises out of an understanding of how instigating and attractive the dissemination of knowledge can be, the dissemination of art, technology, and science. And we can do this without compartmentalizing different fields of knowledge. We can share different perspectives. We can share ex the experiences of specific fields that before were dedicated to what we used to call science. So we're opening up to an understanding that knowledge involves many different facets and culture and art and the arts and all of the experiments in the humanities is related to that. The discoveries, the inventions, and the most interesting inventions that we work with today a lot of these things open up new worlds to us and this allows us each one of us to reach our full potential it's this understanding that's moving that's that's encouraging the publication of content including articles and research projects. And we're open to different languages and styles, such as the language of the arts, 
the language of experiments and research. So what we're trying to do is bring people and readers closer to what before was siloed in specific areas. So our magazine would like to, and unfortunately the video uh, was interrupted, so Ailton Kranach uh, was a part of the first edition of this publication that we released, that was released last year. So he was uh, here to talk about the power of collectives. The second edition had the, uh, the contribution of Mario Lovello that talked about uh, the universe and movement. And here we have the third edition that has a different identity. And this edition talks about, or in, in this edition we interviewed Siddhartha Ribeiro, talking about the awakening of dreams. And today we're launching the agent of now with Pro Professor Lima. And so we will have some editions of this magazine available outside for you to pick up and have a look at. So, Ana Paula, would you like to talk about the process of curatorship? Okay, so my name is Ricardo. Um, I, was, I was speaking away from the microphone so you could locate me. So my name is Bernardo. I'm using brown sneakers, brown pants, and a Bordeaux button-up shirt. So Ailton gave a good summary of our magazine because we're talking about a magazine that brings the essence of different fields of knowledge that are considered non-traditional. You know, fields of knowledge that have been uh, imported from uh, 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 centers of uh, European centers of knowledge. Here, the research is done for people, and so in our magazine we include these different territories, the different subjects, and people's ancestors, and so. Our magazine is different because it brings forth this science that we today is called ethnoscience. This is something that people don't consider science. Krenaki himself, in his books, he says that he doesn't write books. He doesn't write books or, or an article the way we write things. His books are written based on his talk because that's how he works. And that's not considered science for academia. So we treat science differently with our publication. It's a decentralized science that, that's non-hegemonic. Hegemonic. And we try to shy away from this Eurocentric kind of way of working. So good afternoon to everyone. My name is Ana Paula. I'm editorial coordinator of the Humanos publication. So it's great to be able to work on this with this team. That's always bring a lot to uh, our work. I, I learn a lot from what we do. And we learn a lot, because if, and I think that's the objective of our publication. Our objective is to share knowledge. Hegiano, when Hegiano Nobrega thought about this magazine, when she wanted to create this magazine, she wanted it to be a, a publication for young people. Not just in the way that we write, but also in the content that we include. Uh, I wonder if it's possible for us to show the website of our magazine on the screen. Okay, there we go. So this is the last edition. You can see the cover in the corner. We've got this incredible artwork done by uh, Henardi. Where is he? I can't see him. 
So this artwork that we have at the cover of the magazine was done by him. And here we have a digital collage. It's a new style that, uh, that we're seeing a lot of. And it's great to see so many young people here today. Do you like digital collages? Is that something, that, that's something that you're used to seeing, right? At Floop, uh, we saw a lot of this. I don't know if any of you went there, but there was a lot. There were a lot of digital collages from an, an artist called Senegambi. And here, in our case, we have an artist that comes from a region of Minas Gerais called Vale do Rio Doce, and he created this artwork, which is a futuristic uh, piece of art. Olha, ali em cima tem as entrevistas, and né? so anyway, you can see here that we've got links to interviews, we've got reports, we've got in whole uh, upload, we've got lots of different sections in our magazine, and I want to talk to you about each one of these sections. So the interviews, we had a first interview with Ailton Krenak, he's a well-known person, I think you all probably know him, he's the guy that showed up in the video. And he's always sharing a lot of knowledge with us. And we had a second interview with somebody who's not as well known, Mario Lovello. Well, perhaps he's not as well known to most of the population, but he's a great intellectual. He's the, the third in the lineage uh, uh, in terms of academic advising involving Einstein. So he's one of the... Uh, one of the persons responsible for creating theories about the creation of the universe. So he's here from Rio de Janeiro, and he just turned 80. And so the objective of this magazine is, is to show how these people are actually very accessible to us. They're people like us. There isn't this idea of you know them being inaccessible geniuses. So we shouldn't believe that science can only be done by geniuses. Because after all, we're here, you know, exchanging information. And when you exchange information, we can talk about science fiction, we can talk about cosmology, we can talk about cartoon strips. All of this is information that we can share. We've got an area of our website. <laughs> For those of you who like tales, um, you can access uh, uh, the, w the website of our magazine. There's a new tale uh, for each edition of our magazine. So we have this story here that was created by Lu and Zyla. She's a, a, a futurist writer. And there, it, the, these tales are always really interesting. We have a quadriando, which involves cartoon strips. And in each edition, we've got a, car a cartoon strip uh, artist that uh, complements or that finishes or continues the story of another comic strip artist. So click on Aline Zuvi, if you can. Okay, so here you've got a self-portrait done by her. We always ask uh, people to submit their uh, self-portraits. So here she talks about her story, and she shares with us her comic strips. So if you'd like to see this, you can go into the section, you can see the different books from these artists. And here we've got a story that is completed uh, by different artists uh, in each edition of our magazine. So in each edition, we have a new plot twist. We've got something new that's happening in this story. And so we're always left at a, at a cliffhanger uh, in terms of how these stories will continue. We've also got this interesting section called In Hedge or In Network, where we invite people to work uh, do research in <laughs> networks. <laughs> 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 
Ai, olha, essas ilustrações so here you can see these Camilo beautiful Martins. illustrations é, done by Camilo Martins. Também, olha, procurem o Camilo Martins, ele é um ilustrador and incrível. Camilo Martins é, is an incredible illustrator. A cada edição a gente traz and um pesquisador. In each edition we pode ir descendo. We a have alguns pesquisadores do mundo, a, a cada um researcher. deles com sua pesquisa em um campo diferente. And so here in this in the section of the website you can see a portrait of the different uh, researchers uh, that collaborate with our magazine. The idea here is that you know we want you we want to get to know these scientists. We want to we want to see who these scientists are and what they're doing. And you know we're always talking to scientists and we're asking in this case we're asking them what they find fa fascinating in their in their research projects. So this is a really interesting section because this area gives us this idea that you can actually like the generation and acquisition of knowledge. And so this is what the magazine tries to do. It tries to integrate art, science, and technology within academia, outside academia. So we're bringing artists uh, to our platform, we've got new published material, and everything here is new. The interviews are new, the news reports are always dealing with very contemporary topics. The bio, etc. part uh, deals with topics related to biology. And that's it. So you can um, download the PDF. No próprio site, tem o PDF on the website, the PDF is available, but you can always é, just navigate through the different sections and share this with your friends. You can, uh, you can also send us messages through Sesc's Instagram page. You can tell us what tales you liked, what authors you liked. Tell us what you thought about the interviews. Muito feliz. Ah, ó, tá passando a, so, a versão do PDF. Here, Essa é this a is the PDF that's being displayed. So, aqui, né? na, na impressa. so this is exactly like uh, the, the, Gomes, the printed version. Fora, vai estar disponível. É so this interview here with Lima Gomes is incredible. É, citando, I né? got very emotional da, reading it. We, uh, Adriana and I, were a part of this interview, and it's, it was a great interview. So I hope you like it. So here we've got another collage that was done. And so I'm really proud of the work that we did, because basically our magazine brings a lot of people together. Uh, we've got people doing uh, writing, doing different uh, art projects. So I think we've got a lot of very enriching material, and I hope I was able to present everything to you really well. And guys, the website is really simple, www.revistahumanos.com.br. Going to that address, you'll be able to have access to what we just showed you. This publication is one of the activities that's being uh, done by Sesc Rio and its commitment uh, to scientific literacy. So please access the material, send us, you can send us messages as well, and outside you can see the printed version of the magazine, so you can go outside and, and, and get the actual physical version. So on behalf of SESC and on behalf of education, I'd like to wish you a good afternoon. And Oh, and do you want to say something? There? Yeah, come up here. Come on, you're our manager. So tomorrow we're going to be uh, displaying uh, some uh, work that has been done. I'm really moved. Um, here is watching us. Thank you ever so much um, for being here from the beginning to the end. Marcelo, um, I'm not going to mess around with the order, but tomorrow we're going to have some mini courses. We've got other presentations of work. We're going to be looking at inclusive education on Friday and tomorrow at 6 p.m. We've got Conceição Evarista Barbara Terini. And other guests will be here because 
we're going to end our day here now in this auditorium, but outside we've got a cocktail. Um, but thank you ever so much. Thank you, Ana Paula. Bernardo, Adriano as well. Can you hear me? The journal is so important, and, and Ailton Krenaki is someone with whom I share uh, an interesting story from a literary festival in Salvador. He was there as one of the speakers, and obviously I went and spoke to him, and when I went to speak to him, he didn't let me speak. He, <laughs> he would just make, ask me lots of questions. Oh, how do you use this? What's this for? And I said, hang on a minute. I'm the one who's asking the questions here. <laughs> Is it okay? That's fine. Yeah, what do you want, do you want to ask me? And he asked me so many questions that I, that I realized, I stopped and I realized that I just wanted to spend some time with him. So I started ex answering his questions. Oh, well, this is to help me with my movement here. This is to raise the seat. So thank you ever so much for your work with this publication. I know it's a channel that's incredibly important for education and for also entertainment. So congratulations for what you've achieved. It's amazing. I think you've noticed that I like parody and paraphrasing things and and there's a song by Zeca Pagodinho, which is this one here. I think maybe you could adapt that song for your publication, Humanos. I'd like to thank you all very much for being here. For all of those who have been watching us on YouTube as well. So I hope tomorrow you're going to be with us. Um, we'll have our live broadcast from 6 p.m. And it's great to have all of you here on this journey about education, humanity, society, people. Thank you very much. We're going to have a cocktail now, an open cocktail of this fourth edition of our global conference on education. You're all invited and we'll also have a small show from José Conrad, Josiel Conrad, who will be playing some music to us, for us rather. So you're all invited to this event and be able to share all the experiences that we're um, having here. Thank you and a good evening to all of you. Oh, just one other thing. We'd like to take a photo with everybody. Is that okay?